Me the slide, Jim, picture uh, four. The picture we've been trying to, I've been trying to use over this series of Advent is enlarged in the waiting and the images of a, of a young woman who is, is, is going to have a baby soon. And the words of uh, Advent are week number one is uh, prepare, wait, week two is prepare, and week three is rejoice. When I tried to think through, now this is a man talking, I'm trying to figure out if I was her and if the idea is enlarged in the waiting, I understand wait, I get that. I understand prepare, but from what I heard from pretty reliable sources, um, the next step, I'm not sure how much joy is in birth, but that's the picture. So let me give you, tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story. There was a church in a small town, and there was a mom who had cancer. They have a number of children in their family. And it's been very hard for their family to, to process this cancer. And the church they go to celebrates Advent and talks about that. And so in week one, you have wait. Wait for Jesus in the midst of cancer. Prepare for Jesus in the midst of cancer. And then they've been reading a devotional, this family, and it's rejoice. Rejoice in the midst of cancer for a parent that might not live very long. So the pastor of this particular church was walking through that building and evening, kind of late. Mike, need some coffee, need some water? Can I help you out? Okay? I'll share with you. It's all good. Hey, I've been there. That's not fun. And the pastor heard this little, some, some sounds. And so the pastor walked and followed the sounds and there was a little boy of that family, probably four or five years old. And the boy was in this part of the church, and the little boy was doing this. We joyce! We joyce! We joyce! And then saw the pastor. And the pastor said, We joyce! <laughs> when life is hard, can you rejoice? When life is really fast and full, as we're coming to Christmas and it's getting, can we rejoice? I'd like to have us look at two passages of Scripture. One is the Old Testament, Isaiah, and one is the book of Luke. And look at a young woman who chose to rejoice. Could I invite you to open your Bibles, please, to Isaiah chapter 61. And I'd like to, to read from this, verses 1 through 11. So you're, this may be familiar to you. These words were the first words that Jesus read and spoke on at his first sermon. And the title is The Year of the Lord's Favor. So these are written hundreds of years before Jesus, who is called the Messiah. And these are a description hundreds of years before Messiah came about the one that we celebrate as Jesus. Verse 1, the year of the Lord's favor. So the first few verses, I'm going to talk real quickly through this. The Messiah has a liberation mission. Look what it is. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of despair. They'll be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. First three verses, it's the Messiah's liberation mission. Now, when Jesus spoke those words, the hearers, we're talking Isaiah right now, hundreds of years later, Jesus takes those same words 
and he, those are red, and he speaks to them. When you hear, if you were Hebrew, and you heard the phrase, the year of the Lord's favor, what would you hear? It's called the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, this is what was supposed to happen to the people of Israel. All debts were wiped out. So let me use myself as an example. Let me walk you through what happened. Debts are wiped out. If I owned farmland, and because of my debts, I had to sell my farmland to, to Janet, 50 years later, my farmland that was part of my family would be given back to me. If I owned, owed money to a bank, after 50 years, the debt would be completely paid, and I would be free of all debt. If I or my children were in slavery at year 50, all of us would be freed. No more slavery. Jesus' first sermon, which is prophesied 100 years before in Isaiah 61, the year of the Lord's favor, when Messiah comes, people are going to be set free. Now, quick time out. What is it we're actually focusing on in the season of Advent? It's the one who came to set us free. Let me give you a picture of rescue in your heads before I go farther. When, uh, in 1999, Lane and I were given the opportunity to go to Israel. So we went there and we, we had the, the, the tour and all that stuff. But there was a particular moment that just really got my heart. We went to the museum. I don't know what's called, not a museum. The place where the, uh, a, a memorial to six million Jews who were killed. And I'm not sure what the architecture is. I don't know how they've designed it. But as you walk in with very quiet music, as you walk through this thing and you walk like this, and it takes about 20 minutes, when you finally get to the end point, our whole group of around 50 people, we were all weeping. The sense of sadness at that many people being so horribly killed just, just overwhelmed us. And we just stood there in silence and wept. You leave the place, and immediately when you leave, there is an exhibit for a man named Schindler. Have you ever heard of the movie Schindler's List? That man was on a rescue mission. This narcissistic, self-absorbed man who only wanted to make money somehow got reconfigured, and he wanted to save the lives of the people who work for him. And he spared more than 1,000 Jewish people. He's received the highest honor for the country of Israel. And after you go through this whole gut-wrenching place, you see his picture and you read the story of someone who came to rescue. The story of Christmas is someone came to rescue. Let me tell you what I'm thinking about. Remember back the Sunday after Thanksgiving, we did the big thing on the screen with the, all the universe and all that garbage, and I had the golf ball? Remember that? 2,000 years ago, when the Son of God came to the golf ball, what was the second thing that happened? A king killed all the baby boys. Why? Because behind the king is demonic power. And Satan knew that the baby who came for the golf ball was on a rescue mission. And the baby had to die. How many times in the Gospels, before Jesus is killed, do people try to kill him. Why? Because Jesus is on a rescue mission. So he starts in Isaiah 61 talking about someone who's going to bring a year of favor, a jubilee year, a Messiah. Well, look at the next few verses, verses 4 through 7. Shame is going to be replaced with honor. A nation that was destroyed in that day was shamed. Verse 4. 
They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They'll renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. Something good is going to happen. And you'll be called priests of the Lord. You'll be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations in the riches you will boast. Look at verse 7. Instead of your shame, you'll receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. The other night, shame replaced with honor. I was invited into a situation with one of our elders, very painful situation. And because of the situation and what had occurred, the person was filled with shame, incredible shame. And so we were invited in to listen, and for a significant amount of time, for whatever reason, the people felt free to come clean with shame. And oh my, did their shame, their hurt, because of sin, just get raised. And we sat there together, the elder and I, and we sat there and we wept trying not to show our tears as we listen to all this incredible hurt. And at the end, this group of people looked at us, we too, and said, what do you have to say about that? And the elder took off his glasses and said to them, 30 years ago, I did what you did. And I have been set free. His shame was turned to honor. He could enter someone's shame and say, I was there. I did that but that's not who I am, that's who I was. About two months ago, I was involved in a situation with demonic stuff with some people, a group, a team of people. And in the conversation with the evil that was being expressed, the the voice that came out of the person began to describe the sexual history of every person in that room. And the people who were there were shamed because what we had done was now publicly exposed to other people from our church. And the last person who was shamed by the voice said, in the name of Jesus, I tell you to be quiet. That's what I what once was. I am no longer that person. And then there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. First three verses, Isaiah 61, Messiah comes. Year of Jubilee. The next four verses, We're going to turn shame into honor when Messiah comes. The next two verses, the promise of a covenant. Verses 8 and 9. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I'll reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. An everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations, their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge there are people the Lord has blessed. I will make an everlasting covenant. 2,000 years ago, before he died, our Lord at the Passover took the cup, which was typically used at the Passover meal, seven cups. At the fourth cup, Jesus changed the words. He changed the liturgy. Blessed art thou, king of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. Jesus did not say that. Jesus said, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, you do this in remembrance of me. The Messiah brings a new covenant. But the passage goes on. What else happens here? I need to quickly run through this. Verses 10 and 11, look at the saving power, look at Messiah's saving power, and look at the imagery. Verse 10, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. These are the words Mary will use. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation, arrayed me in robes of his righteousness. Look at the first image, a wedding. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and a a bride adorns herself with jewels. What's that going to be like? Our son Clayton is married to Kelly. Before they moved to, to Knoxville, Part, one of our part-time jobs was to serve as a wedding coordinator in the, the western suburbs of Chicago. Several weddings of which she was the, the event coordinator, listen to this, cost $100,000. And she said to us, that is not uncommon today in western, western Chicago. $100,000. Can you imagine the amount of beauty and decorations and all at that wedding? When Messiah comes, it's going to be like a hundred million dollar wedding. The next image, verse 11, think about this one, agriculture. For as soil makes a sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord, the Messiah, will make righteousness and praise spring up before the nations. When Messiah comes, saving power, and it's going to be an incredible time of joy. It'll be a time of great fruitfulness. So, 400 years before Jesus comes, a prophet hears words from the Lord. He writes them down, but put in the text, and then a young woman has a crazy encounter with God. You open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Let's look at two images really fast. So first, let's get, uh, Jim, can I have a picture on slide five? This is a Henry Osawa Tanner's painting. I think it's one of the best on the Annunciation. This is, the, this is what we're going to read about in just a moment. So just try to imagine. I heard John MacArthur say this week, John MacArthur, who is a well-known scholar, they think Mary is 12 or 13. They thought Joseph was 15. That's John MacArthur. So imagine a 12 or 13-year-old woman, and now we're going to read what happens. Chapter 1, verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, highly graced. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at the angel's words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor, same word, grace, with God. You'll conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Yeshua, the one who saves. He will be great, and we called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. An impossible thing is going to happen. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's Lord's servant, Dula. I am the Lord's slave, Mary answered. May may your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Now I'm going to talk about Mary for a couple minutes now. So we have this prophecy from Isaiah 61. Messiah comes, all this is going to happen. I've been stewing on this for three weeks. And uh, Lane, my wife, is getting her master's in spiritual formation. And we've been talking about this now for several months. And uh, so I have to admit, I have, a, uh, I have a, a bias, a personal bias against Mary. Uh, that's my Protestant thing, just my Reformed Protestant thing embedded pretty deeply. 
And Lane in her, her wisdom has been slowly pushing me to think more deeply about this. I, I wanna, I wanna, I'm trying to pack this with you a little bit. So how is it that a 12 or 13-year-old woman, I mean, this is a girl, she probably just has reached the age of puberty, the season of puberty. How is it, in just a minute, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you look at what she said after this visitation. How can a young woman, now it's a girl, remember Jewish deal was about men? A boy could have a bar mitzvah, a movement into adulthood. Girls didn't have that. Girls did not receive education. Girls were not trained to read. Girls were not invited to read the Torah. So one of the things I've been wrestling with, so the Holy Spirit comes on this young woman, but she is going to, just a moment, I'm going to show you, she's going to take 12 concepts or words from Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel. And she is going to rejoice with something the Holy Spirit draws up from within her. I want you to think this through a little bit. Somehow there was something in this young woman that when this angel came, she was open and receptive. If you read the same chapter of Luke, the priest, the clergy person, when God shows up, how, no, 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 no. But this young woman is available. How did that happen? Well, I have a wondering. I don't know. But could it be that for this young woman, maybe there was an older woman in her life? Or perhaps maybe a priest? One of the elders came out to me last service and said, what if she was from the tribe of Levi? What if her dad or grandpa or uncle were a priest? And they often read the scriptures. How did people learn back in that day? You listened. For centuries and to this day, people do not read all over the world. They transmit their people's history almost without mistake through oral transmission. How is that possible? Well, what if the words of God were somehow implanted in this young woman? Let me tell you what I'm, let me, let me tease this out with you a little bit. So what would it be like if you were 12 or 13 and you're pregnant and you give birth to a perfect son and you have multiple other children? Tradition says that Joseph died. You have a single mom of multiple children and one of them is perfect. How do you, as a mother, work with a perfect son, with imperfect other children? Well, the story goes on. He announces his first sermon, Isaiah 61, he's Messiah. And she and her children think he's nuts. How, but, we, how, but she keeps watching him and he ends up at a cross. And he ends up on a cross and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And she's standing there watching her son die. Do you remember the movie, The Passion of the Christ? Do you remember that scene when Jesus is carrying the cross and he is shredded with blood and the scene, he stops and looks down an alley. Remember that scene? And his mother sees him. When I saw that scene, it just hit me. What if that was one of my kids? And she watched him go to the cross. And she watched him suffer and die. And then she goes with others and he's gone. And then she's in an upper room and he shows up. How do you process all this? Two things. Somehow the spirit of the Lord had space to work in her life. And somehow the words of God were embedded. And somehow those two things impacted her. But let me just take it one more step farther. 
Lane has a phrase, and I, she can say it. I can't. This is a woman say, saying this. Lane says, a mother's voice is in her children's heads. A mother's voice is in her children's heads. So Jesus, early in his life, in his ministry, goes to the lake, and there are thousands of people here called the Anavim. These are the losers. These aren't the priests. These aren't the famous people. These aren't the rich people. These are the losers. And Jesus says to the losers of Israel's culture, blessed are you when people make fun of you and revile you, for yours is the kingdom of the heavens. Jesus said, blessed are you who mourn, for you'll be comforted. Blessed are you, blessed are you. Jesus had the words of Scripture. He had the moving of the Spirit. And he had his mother's voice in his head. What do you think? Well, that's, that's pushing it. Okay, let's push it a little farther. When Jesus was dying on the cross... What did he say to John? James and John were called what? The sons of thunder. Why? When they're walking with Jesus and they see the Samaritans, they say, hey, let's call down fire and torch all those half-breeds. Kill them all in Jesus' name. Hey, Jesus, when you die and your kingdom comes, James wants to sit on your right, I want to sit on your left. Come on, Jesus, we're the sons of thunder. Let's go. After that, Jesus washes their feet. So you got James and John. You got John, the son of thunder. Okay, what does Jesus do on the cross? He looks down at John. Says, John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. Go 50 years later. John is now on the Isle of Patmos. He's a prisoner on a penal colony. And everybody thought he was nuts. If you read 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, what do you read? Love. Agapao. Love. Love. They said, the guy's crazy. He'd walk around this penal colony. And this is what tradition said. Love your brothers. Love your sisters. Love. Listen. Mary's voice was in his head. Who was in Mary's head? The work of the Spirit and the words of God. Out of that, she writes these words. She sang them. Verse 46. Verse 46. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant, Dula, slave. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty ones has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Now look at all, there's a unique Greek instruction here. So let me do it from verses 50 to 55. Let me read it and tell you what it is. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He scattered those who are proud in their, midst, in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones. He's lifted up the humble, but he's filled the hungry with good things. He has sent away the rich empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised. Now look at verse 50. His mercy extends. Verse 51, he has performed... Two more lines, he has scattered. Verse 52, he has brought down. Two more lines, but has lifted up. 53, he has filled. Two more lines, has sent away the rich empty. Verse 54, he helped his servant. Verse 55, he remembered. Let me explain that to you now. There is no time for God. The, instru in the, the construction, the original language is what God did then, he will do now. So what you read about her saying, this is what the Lord is going to do. He's done it in the past. He's going to do it again. He's going to do it in the future as well. So she is rejoicing in what God will do. 
Let me give you a story about this, this crazy story. George Mueller, one of my heroes. George Mueller was a man who, during about World War II, was very involved with orphans. And at that time in England, there was a boatload of people, young people who were orphans and had no place to live. And so over the period, course of his lifetime, he fed, housed, and educated 10,000 orphans and never asked for one penny. It's incredible, crazy. George Mueller, read about his life. Crazy man of devotion. Interesting theme again. He has the words of God in his heart and the spirit of God directing him as he prays. He prayed for two friends. And these two friends wanted nothing to do, zero, with Jesus. Zero. No matter how much they watched George Mueller do his work and care for all these orphans, they thought he was a crazy fool. He prayed for one friend. Listen to this. He prayed for one friend for 66 years. And George Mueller died. Three years later, that friend became a follower of Jesus. From God's perspective, there is no time. So what you see in her prayer song, her prayer, her rejoicing is what God has done, God will do, and he will do it even uniquely and specially. This week I sat with some other challenging situations in great tears. Some person said, this and this and this is going on. Really, really painful, bad stuff. And I said, but honey, someday this is going to happen. When Jesus returns again, this is going to happen. What is wrong and evil and horrible and despicable and tragic is going to be turned. And so we celebrate. Like this young woman, Mary, she was celebrating something that she couldn't really imagine, but something embedded in word and scripture gave her hope for joy for the future. So here's my question. This, here it is. So, so how crabby are you? How sad are you? How complaining are you? Or how hopeful? How happy? How blessed? How much joy? If a 12-year-old girl who is said she is inbreded by the Holy Spirit, I bet that played really well, Nazareth. Yeah, yeah, I was just praying, and the angel showed up, and woo I'm pregnant, and boy, I'm going to have God's son come and celebrate with me. How'd that play? How'd it play all her life saying, your kid's a bastard? How's it play to watch your kid die? How's it play? How's it play? And she's rejoicing in God, her Savior. My question for us is, we've been waiting for Jesus. We've been preparing for Jesus. Can we rejoice in the Jesus who's coming? I'm going to give you, a, can I have um, slide eight? So I'd, I'd like to just set this up and then take three minutes, maybe two, whatever you would give me. So I want you to think about the little boy in the first story whose parent is dying of cancer. And I want you to hear that little boy say, we joice. We joice. In the midst of mystery, misunderstanding, suffering, and great challenge, Mary was able to rejoice. How? May I just observe from reading the story, trying to tell it to you. She submitted herself to the Lord. She pondered the things she heard from the Lord. Bless you. She admitted how powerless, how helpless she was. And she prayed. And then she trusted. She made space. She made physical space in her life for Christ's presence. So my question for us in conversation is, is this possible for us? In these next seven days, is it possible to make some space for Jesus? So let's take two minutes. It's 10, 16, 15, two minutes. If you're comfortable, will you share with someone around you, one or two, one, maybe one person share and the others just listen and respond? How is it possible for you to make space in your life this week for Christ's presence? Can you give it a shot? If you don't want to, 
Go ahead and just pray. On your marks, get set. Please share. If you'd like to receive communion, elders are willing to serve you. If you'd like to receive the ministry of prayer, we invite you to go to the place of prayer. If you leave, leave with the blessing of the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, may the presence and power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. As you leave, could you rejoice? God bless.